you have a Bible, I'd love for you to take it out and open it to the book of 2 Kings. The book of 2 Kings, chapter 6. My uh, dad grew up in the country, and not just the country, but the country part of country, the, the Duck Dynasty kind of country. And uh, when I was in, later in high school, I asked him, uh, because he has two brothers, one of whom is a couple years older, one a couple years younger, and they're all built just alike, they look just alike, but I, you know, it just came out that while my dad and his older brother played a lot of sports, his younger brother didn't. And so I asked him one day why that was, and my dad got this kind of sheepish, guilty look on his face, and he said, well, he said, when I was eight, year old, eight years old and your Uncle Kenny was six, he said, uh, we kind of set up this game, the three of us, um, and we were trying to throw a, um, a hatchet between our legs and stick it into a, a stump, you know, that was there. And so we'd, we'd do it and we'd, you know, launch it. He said, so it was my turn, and I'm kind of gearing up to do it. He said, and, and your Uncle Kenny's holding our little puppy, and right at the time that I'm about to throw this, it, you know, the, the, the puppy starts squirming and jumps out and runs across. And he said, so your Uncle Kenny went after it right at the time that I released the hatchet. And they said it just clocked him right here and severed the, the optic nerve in his left eye. And he said that, uh, he said after that he lost depth perception. That's why I never really played organized sports. Now I'm sitting there as a senior in high school and I'm like, this is the man that tells me not to run with a pen in my hand, um, has lost all moral credibility with me. Um, but you know, when you hear about an accident that, that affects your eyesight, it, there's something especially terrifying about it because um, you, you, you know how much difference your life would be if, if you lost your eyesight. Uh, I remember when I got LASIK surgery, it was about 10 years ago. My, um, uh, it was right before uh, we had the, the birth of our first daughter, and about three days before the surgery, my wife and I, I know it's a totally irrational thought, but we just had this thought, like, what if something goes wrong, you know, in this? Like, what if, you know, there's like an earthquake while they're doing the LASIK and it, you know, burns my eyes? I never see my daughter. You know, this just to lose your sight. Everything would look different in life, <laughs> no pun intended. Everything would be different in life if you, you lost your sight, right? I mean, you'd never know um, the thrill of looking into the eyes of somebody that you love. You'd never know the nuances and the beauty of color. You would never um, know that sense of delight that you feel when you, when you look into your children's faces and you see the, the look of delight on their faces. Spiritual sight is 10,000 times more important than physical sight because spiritual sight is how we perceive God. And without spiritual sight, we miss out on the most glorious displays in the universe. Probably one of the most tragic curses of the fall was that our sin left us spiritually blind and perhaps even worse, unaware that we were blind. We still, people that are physically blind are aware that they're blind, but those who are spiritually blind usually think that they can see. As a seminary student, the most important thing that we can develop is spiritual sight, and the most important thing that you can give to people is spiritual sight. It's not the same as knowledge. And I suppose you, if you haven't learned that yet, you will learn that. That's why it's kind of proverbial that the driest time spiritually you might ever have in your life is when you're in seminary listening to the Word of God taught like you've never heard it before, because knowledge is not the same thing as, as sight. There is something that about sight that just cannot be given in a classroom. It's something that comes somewhere else. So what I want to do is walk you through the only Old Testament story that I know of, at least, where someone is being healed of blindness. Elisha, 2 Kings 6, is the greater prophet that has been promised to succeed Elijah. Elisha's ministry was remarkable. He did things that no prophet who had ever come before him had ever done. But he was just, we learn, a foreshadowing of the greatest prophet, Jesus, who would do in substance everything that Elisha, as great as his ministry was, only yielded in shadow. Elisha's name in Hebrew literally means Jehovah saves, Eli or God saves, Eli Shah, Eli God Shah, the root for salvation. And his ministry points to the unique saving powers of God. Uh, so you have to read this story of Elisha healing blindness. You got to read it through the lens of what Jesus would accomplish, what he would fulfill. Elisha is going to give you in shadow what Jesus is going to give you in substance. In fact, when John the Baptist sent messengers to ask Jesus, how to, remember when John the Baptist was in prison and he was starting to doubt whether or not Jesus was the Messiah because you know, a lot of things hadn't happened that John was expecting? You remember what he said? He said, Jesus said, go back and tell John the Baptist that the dead are raised, the lepers are cleansed, the blind see. He basically went through the ministry of Elisha and said, the greatest of all prophets, what he did, I am doing and I am fulfilling in substance what he did in shadows. So we have to read this story, as we do all the Old Testament, we have to read it through the lens of what Jesus accomplished. 
Verse 8, chapter 6, now the king of Aram, or some of your Bibles may say Syria, I'm reading this from the, the NIV. The king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I'll set up my camp in such and such a place, and I'll ambush the children of Israel. But then the man of God, Elisha, would send word to the king of Israel, well, beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are there. Time and time again, Elisha warned the king so that he was always a step ahead of the Arameans. Well, as you can imagine, verse 11, this enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me, which one of you, which, who's the mole, who's the rat, which one of you was on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king. They looked around, none of us, none of us is the mole. We're all faithful, none of us is the rat, said one of his officers, but Elisha. The prophet who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. He taps our phone lines. He reads your emails. He's like the original NSA. And he just everywhere. Verse 13, well, you go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a mighty army there. They went by night and they surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up, and he went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Do not be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the servant looks around, he's like, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? There's two of us, there's thousands of them. So then Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Now strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. Elisha then told them, This is not the road, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will lead you to the man that you are looking for. Is that like a Jedi mind trick that he just did, right? <laughs> These are not the droids that you were looking for. By the way, this is kind of important. Hebrew scholars point out that this was probably not a total blindness. Because if it was a total blindness, it wouldn't make sense that they would continue on with their mission. Hey, none of us can see anything anymore, but why don't you go ahead and lead us to where we are so we can get our job done. If it was total blindness, they would have collapsed on the ground and pled for help. The Hebrew scholars say the way that it's written and even the terminology that's used mean that it is a delusion kind of blindness. They, they, they think they see. They think that Elisha is not who they're looking for when he is, and he's going to take them to a place that they don't know that they're going, thinking they're going to the place they've intended all along. So he leads them to Samaria, which was about 12 miles from where they were. It was about a three-hour walk. <laughs> You've got to ask this question. What did they talk about for those three hours? What kind of small talk did they make? And this is the guy they're looking for, and he's got to talk with them for three hours. Um, that's probably not the question that Dr. Morita would tell us to ask of the text, but I still think it's a valid one. So um, he talks with him for three hours to Samaria. Samaria was at that time, by the way, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, where the king of Israel lived with all of his army. So he's walking them right into a trap where they're completely vulnerable. As they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, now open the eyes of these men so now they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria, in front of the armies, in front of the palace, completely vulnerable. I mean, this is the old crud moment. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them? My father, shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you've captured with your own sword and bow? In other words, do you typically kill prisoners of war? I mean, even in those days, the answer was no. He said, These aren't even your prisoners of war. You didn't take them. God took them. They're God's prisoners of war. So he says, Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. And I love this next line. So from then on, the bands from Aram, from Syria, stop raiding Israel's territory. Ultimate victory is not to destroy your enemies. Ultimate victory is to turn your enemies into friends and allies, which is what Elisha does, at least with this group here. Now, I'm almost tempted to ask a room full of seminary students, how many of you have never heard that story, or at least the latter part of it before? Don't raise your hand. The majority of us are not familiar with that story, at least not that we could tell it, and tell it in a way that we get most of the details right. But it's incredibly important because Jesus would say, what Elisha did here is setting up what I'm going to do. So if you want to understand everything I did, you've got to go back to the story and understand some of the context of what he's giving you a sign of. The plot of this story revolves around two sets of blind people. One set only has one person in it, a believer. The other set is a group of unbelievers, and what both most need is to have their eyes opened. So let's talk first about 
number one, if you're taking notes, the blindness of the believer. The blindness of the believer. Elisha's servant was terrified because he saw the size of the army arrayed against him. But he was blind to the presence of the God fighting for him and the size of the army that he brought to the battle. Essentially, the servant doubted two things about God. And he was a very religious man. He was Elisha's assistant. In fact, you could say he was next in line for Elisha's job. He doubted two things about God, the steadfastness of God's love toward him and the strength of God's power for him. He thought God had abandoned him. He's like, we're surrounded. We've been abandoned. There is no hope. Martin Luther said that the essence of sin for a believer or an unbeliever is a lack of faith in God's goodness. Every sin, Luther said, every sin begins with an evil heart of unbelief. Now, we often find that easy to recognize in an unbeliever. They reject God's ways, they go their own way, because they believe, or they don't, are not convinced of God's goodness and his wisdom. But what this story shows you is that the believer is often just as blind and unbelieving. We doubt his loving control over our lives, and that's why we are anxious. That's why we are fearful. That's why we are afraid. Luther says the, the essence of the unbelieving heart, listen to this, is that we see God as our adversary. And we wrestle with that years, he said, after we're saved. The evil heart of unbelief of the flesh is always wanting to creep back in and push out the gospel. So we can't really trust him. He's our adversary, which is why we're afraid. We always feel like we got to protect ourselves against God. Luther would, would explain that that's what makes the good works of religious people often so offensive to God, is that they come from a heart of unbelief. They're built on the assumption that God is an adversary who needs to be won over, that we got to perform at a certain level before God is going to love and bless us. So we're constantly saying, now again, an unbeliever and a believer are going to express this differently, but it's the same heart behind it. They're both going to be saying, God, have I done enough? Have I done enough now? Are you going to bless me now? Have I studied enough, learned enough, prayed enough? Are you going to bless my ministry? Are you going to, are you going to put your affection on me? Martin Luther said that our good works, listen to this, become a defense against the goodness of God. Now, what an ironic statement. Our, our good works become a defense. Our good works become a defense against the goodness of God because we are not believing what he has declared to us by gift righteousness in the gospel because we don't really believe it. So we just feel much more comfortable trying to earn God's love by our good works and win over an adversary to our side. So what Elisha does is he prays for his servant that God would open his eyes to see that the armies of God's love that surround this murderous horde of Arameans are larger than the armies that are against them and that this huge Aramean army is nothing compared to the millions upon millions of angels that God has surrounding those that he loves. Psalm 34, 5, the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And blessed is the man who finds his refuge in him. When we are afraid or we feel rebellious or whatever, what we need is clearer vision. That's probably why Paul, in the middle of the book of Ephesians, you ever notice this? Two sections of Ephesians. We know how to explain that, doctrine section, application section. What we miss is the thing that's right in the middle, which is a prayer. He suddenly says this, Ephesians 3.18, I pray that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul did something there. By the way, did you catch this? He did something very uncharacteristic of Paul. He lost his words. Paul realizes humbly that he is like the smartest person that's alive at the time. He knows he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, so usually he's like, this is the word of God, you shut up, okay? Just read it right here, it's all very clear. But Paul, at this point, when he comes to talk about the love of God, he loses his words, and he just says, i got to stop because I've just explained to you what the love of God is for three chapters, but I know there's no possible way that you can feel it. I know that you can't sense it. It's not explanation that's going to give it to you. It's revelation that gives it to you, and revelation comes by God's Spirit. So he begins to pray that they can sense that their heart can feel the weightiness of the love of God. There's certain things you just can't describe, you can't put into words. How do you describe color to a blind person? How do you describe the taste of honey to somebody who's never tasted sweetness? So Paul said, I want you to know the link. Well, how long is God's love? Well, Paul actually explained that for you in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, 4, that God has chosen you in him before the foundation of the world. How long is that? I mean, you realize that if you are a believer, what that means is that there has never been a time in the history of the universe that God has not known about you, loved you, set his affection on you, and determined to save you. Before you were born, he determined to save you. Before you sinned, he determined to forgive you. While you wandered, he plotted how to bring you back. 
Then now it's chosen in him before the foundation of the world has to me. I'm not trying to get into the nuances of election. I realize that there's a lot of kind of nuances and, and, and people that love God can see things a little differently. But I think we can all agree on the fact that, that we love him because he first loved us. And that God shows us in him that there's never been a time, regardless of how you, 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 you peel that orange, there's never been a time. There's never been a time that God did not love you. He chose you in eternity past. He didn't do it because he saw goodness in you. We were dead in our sin, Ephesians 2 explained. We were children of wrath. It's like as Dr. Marita often explains here, I explained this at our church a few weeks ago. It's like an adoption. In an adoption, a child does not present his potential to the parent. The child walks in and sets his affection on the child and says, not because of who you are, but because I am choosing you and I'm going to put my affection on you and you're going to become a part of my family. God did not choose us because we were lovely. We became lovely because he chose us. Or maybe to put it again, the words of Luther, the love of God does not find, but creates that which pleases it. The love of God does not first find, it doesn't discover, but it creates that which pleases it. The length of God, how, how high is God's love? Well, here the King David might be able to help us. He says in Psalm 103, as high as the heavens are above the earth. You ever walk out on a starry night and then just get overwhelmed again at how large the bodies that you were looking at actually are. Well, we know more now than King David did. We know that light travels at 186,282.2 miles per second. At least I remember that from a quiz in science class in the 11th grade. We know that it takes eight minutes to get from the sun to the edge of our, or to get to our eyesight. That's how long it takes light to get there. That in the time you snap your fingers, light circumnavigates the globe six times. A light year, one light year, unfathomable, 5,865,696,000,000 miles. Yet the outer edge of the universe, according to astrophysicists, is 15.5 billion light years away. If that seems incomprehensible to you, it's because it's virtually unimaginable. Yet that is the measure that God chose for his love for his people. If it doesn't blow your mind, you've never felt it. You can't reduce it to a page in a systematic theology lecture. It's something that crushes you. It's like seeing when you're blind. The breadth, how wide is the love of God? Wide enough, Paul says in Ephesians 1.11, that it controls all things and moves all things according to the counsel of his will. That there's not one stray molecule in all the universe, or as you see in this story, that he's got 10,000 upon 10,000 angels surrounding every square inch of this planet. I mean, you realize when he opened the eyes of the servant, this is not a stage production where God's like, hey, angels, go down there so we can, you know, show him something. They were already there. He just opened his eyes to him. What if you really believe that? What if you really believe? Listen, because it's not like, again, it's not a stage production. It's just opening your eyes to what's already there. What if you believe that over every failure, over every accident, over every broken relationship, over every rejected job application, there was a band of angels of God's love surrounding you, executing his perfect will. The width of God, the depth of God, how deep is God's love? Paul said, Ephesians 2, deep enough to reach into the lowest hell to save us. While we were dead in our sins, that was then that Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Maybe for a good man, one might dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Believer, what if God really did open your eyes? Based on what we see here in 2 Kings 6, can you imagine what we would see? Do you think then you'd finally be convinced that really nothing can separate you from the love of God, not death or life or angels or rulers or things present or things to come or powers or height or depth. Nothing can separate you from his love. Wouldn't you really say with Paul, if God is for me, then who could be against me? And all things must be working together for good to them who love God are called according to his purpose. Because what God chose in him before the foundation of the world, he has purposed to bring it to plan. And there's not one thing that is ever gonna happen to me that God's angels are not working to make what his intentions are for me come to pass. Did you see how Paul in Ephesians 3, when he said, when you see the height and depth that you'll be filled, you see this whole phrase, you'll be filled with all the fullness of God? Listen, sight, listen, sight and being filled with the Spirit are the same thing. You want a really good definition of being filled with the Spirit? It's seeing these kinds of things Clearly, that's the evidence that the Spirit has come, is that he's opened your eyes, which is why I find it interesting to how Paul 
in another book, Galatians would set up a contrast to being filled with the Spirit and being drunk with alcohol. You ever think about this? Why did Paul say, be, don't be drunk with wine, but do be filled by the Spirit? That's, that's not just Paul picking on a pet sin. Paul's not like, hey, you know, I'm a teetotaler and I just want to drop that before I go on into my spirit section. No, he, he puts those two back to back because watch this, there are two ways of dealing with the same problem. When people feel overwhelmed and they feel afraid, they turn to a spirit, alcohol, what do they try to do? Right? They try to deaden themselves to reality. This is like the theme of every country music song I've ever heard in my life. There's a tear in my beer because I'm crying for you, dear, or whatever. But I, if I can numb myself to reality for a little while, then I can get through this, right? Well, see, by contrast, the spirit does not numb you to reality. He opens your eyes to reality. He shows you a greater reality. He shows you that, yes, the armies that are against you are mighty and would crush you, but the armies that are for you are greater and mightier, and that God's love is steadfast and will never depart from those that he loves. The number one prescription pill, I read this this week, last year in our country was Abilify, which is given to, to treat depression. I, I realize there are, there are valid reasons why that gets prescribed. I'm not, but I'm just saying you realize that our culture's way of dealing with the difficulty that the world presents is simply to distract and deaden for a little while. You can distract through alcohol, you can distract through entertainment, but ultimately it all goes back to this. Enjoy it, have a good time, deaden yourself to the pain, deaden yourself to the questions that philosophy can't answer, and just enjoy yourself. And God says, quite the contrary, be filled with the Spirit and see that yes, the armies against us are great, but the armies of God's love around us are greater. Now I know it's, <laughs> you might say if you're like me, you're like, but I can't see the angels, and I can't even feel their effects either. It would just help me if God would allow me to see this. You think about a situation that you've been through recently, like if I could have seen God, maybe I'd feel better. Let me point out a little detail that you might have overlooked, but a Hebrew person probably would not have overlooked. It was in verse 13. Where did this vision take place? Where did it take place? Dothan. Right? Everybody, can you see it? it's in your Bible? Right? You got your Bible, look at it. It's in Dothan. You ever heard of Dothan? Not Alabama, okay, different Dothan. You ever heard of Dothan? Dothan's only mentioned one other time in the Bible. Genesis 37, 17. Dothan was a place made famous by another man of God in deep trouble, Joseph. Joseph got thrown into a pit in Dothan, and that's where he was sold into slavery. And in that pit, Joseph prayed that God would deliver him. Did God answer his prayers? Yes but not in the way that Joseph was expecting. God answered his prayer by, prayer by instead of being delivered out of the pit, he was sold into slavery. From slavery, he prayed for God to deliver him. And instead, he was sold to Potiphar where he was falsely accused of adultery and he was sent to prison. He prayed there for deliverance and instead God sent him a butler who forgot about him for a long time. Yet because of all these supposedly unanswered prayers, God put Joseph onto the throne of Egypt where he could rescue both himself, his family, and all the people of God, including us. If God had answered Joseph's prayers from the pit the way that Joseph wanted him to, all of Joseph's family would have died, physically and spiritually. So watch this. The chariots of fire and the angels were there for Joseph and Dothan too. They just had their silencers on. They were in stealth mode. And that's how it might be for you sometime, believer. But you can be sure that God is always fighting for you. Even when you cannot hear the footprints of his angels or hear the rumble of his chariots, you can lift up your eyes to the hills from whence comes your help. Your help comes from the Lord. Do not fear, for I am your God. Do not be dismayed, for I am with you. I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you by my right hands. For confirmation of that, you need look no farther than the cross. Because at the cross, that's where God demonstrate his absolute commitment to not ever let anything that he had purposed or intended not come to pass. That's where he showed his willingness and his capacity to save. The resurrection was where he showed his ability to save. And many times, I know we're as confused about our lives as the disciples were confused about the, the, the cross itself. But we know that because God did what he did at the cross, if he put that kind of investment in me, I can be sure that if God spared not his own son for me, will he not also freely give me all things that came to Jesus as a result of what he did for me? Now you say, well, why does God do it that way? Why does he put the stealth mode on? 
To be fair to me, I'm not God. So I can't really answer that question fully. But I do know that one of the things that God is always doing is perfecting our faith. Testing, if you will, our resolve in his goodness. You see, God, I know you know this, but God is not just interested in resolving your situation. He's also interested in restoring your faith. And a lot of times what he'll let you do is he lets you, in fact, let me quote Luther again. Sorry to probably overquote him. But Luther said, what God does is he resists us in prayer the way that a parent resists a child, but he only gives just enough pressure to test our strength, our resolve in his goodness. God sometimes, he sometimes operates that way because the essence of salvation is you come into a place where because of who you know God to be and what he did on the cross, that you will never doubt his love. John Owen said the greatest insult that you could give to God after the cross and resurrection is to doubt his love. For you to be able to say, my faith has found a resting place. I don't need any other argument, any other plea. I know that Jesus died for me and I know that whatever, the world go to hell around me. I know because of the cross and resurrection that he is doing what he said he would do. What you do what you do when you don't know anything else is you go to the cross. John Calvin said that the cross are our spectacles of faith. They bring otherwise blurry situations in our lives into the sharp focus of God's love. Gospel spectacles, he said, give you the ability to see a world that's filled with horses and chariots working all things according to the counsel of his will. What you need, believer, is not a new sight of the angels. What you need is insight into the heart of God, which is what Paul prays for in Ephesians 3. That's the New Testament version of this, of this passage. You think God has abandoned you. You think that broken relationship is going to destroy you, that failure is going to ruin your career, that you are worthless and there is nothing but failure and pain in your future. All lies. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. You taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. That's the blindness of the believer. Now, really quickly, let me deal with the blindness of the unbeliever. The blindness of the unbeliever. How, how, are, how are the unbelievers blind? Well, they think God and his people are their enemies. They think if they can just capture and eliminate the man of God, their problems will be over. So Elisha strikes them with a kind of physical blindness, which really you can see is there to provide them, watch, with a picture of their spiritual blindness, which is why the idea that it's a delusion is so important. They think they can see, but they can't because that's how the whole life of an unbeliever is. They think they can see clearly, but they can't. He then confounds them. He tells them they're seeking the wrong person, then walks them into Israel's capital and puts them in a completely indefensible, vulnerable state, which is what Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 1 that Paul always does, God always does. He confounds with the wise, with their wisdom, and he brings them to ruin, though they never realize it's happening. So you've got a group of people at, around the Tower of Babel building something, in, uh, building this tower as a statement of their independence from God. And what's God do? With one flip of his finger, he confuses their language and confounds them, and they never realize it's happening until after it's over. Isaac, blind Isaac, decides that he wants to rebel against God by giving the blessing to his favorite son, Esau, instead of God's choice, Jacob. So what does God do? God further blinds him and causes him to accidentally give the blessing to the one that God had chosen the whole time. God confounds the worldly wise with their wisdom and they don't even know what's happening. But then, after Elisha confounds them and leads them to a position of complete vulnerability, then he does something nobody's expecting. He throws them a huge feast and lets them go. When their eyes were open, they expected an onslaught of judgment, and instead, Elisha gave them a feast of grace. Do not miss the irony here. They thought the resolution to their problems would come through capturing and destroying God's man. Instead, they found that blessing when they were captured by God's man. So many overtones of Jesus here. The unbelievers of our world, like these blind Aramean soldiers, think that they're going to find what they're looking for by capturing some earthly attainment, a job, a relationship, a certain salary level, a level of fame. But like the Aramean soldiers, they're only going to find what they're looking for when they're captured by God's man. It is only by becoming captives to Jesus, by becoming captive to the truth, that the truth sets us free. Elisha says to them, you're seeking the wrong guy. That's what Jesus said. When Jesus came, everybody missed him. The Romans were looking, and the Romans and the Jews were looking for a political conqueror. The Greeks thought they were looking for a philosopher king. 
So when a real Messiah showed up and he sided with the oppressed and he served the poor and he washed feet and he died on a garbage heap between a couple of criminals as a substitution for sin, they all missed him. So how did God wake him up? Like Elisha, Jesus took his enemies into the heart of his capital, to the throne room of his justice, but instead of judgment, he gave them grace. And instead of calling down the legions of angels upon them in judgment, he prayed, Father, forgive them. He did more than simply throw us a feast and let us go. He poured out the feast of his own flesh and blood and invited us into the very palace of his glorious sons and daughters. So that the Roman soldier looking up to Jesus sees this feast being given. And what does he say? Surely this man is the son of God. And his eyes were open. This is foolishness to an unbeliever. Absolute foolishness. Muslims, if you ever worked with them, I spent a couple of years living with Southeastern in an unreached people group. Muslims have a really hard time with the crucifixion. They believe Jesus was a prophet, one of the 25 prophets. But if you ever heard one explain to you what happened at the cross, they'll, they'll say this. They'll say what happened is right before Jesus went on the cross, God switched him with Judas. Switched him with Judas. You say, well, why is that? And they say this, because God would never let one of his servants or slaves her sons die in that kind of disrepute and under the scorn of the world. He would always vindicate them. Every other, and their, every other prophet had the angels by their side. But you're telling me that in the hour that Jesus needed the angels the most, that God forsook him, God turned his back on them, the angels forsook them, and nobody was there, not even his disciples were there to stand with them? It makes no sense to them. It's foolishness. But the believer whose eyes have been opened looks at that same spectacle, that same foolishness and says, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. Tis mercy all, let earth adore. Let angel minds inquire no more. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? That was God's ultimate victory because it changed rebels and enemies into sons and daughters and allies. You want to know what changes your heart? You want to know what changes the heart of the people that you're leading and preaching to? You want to know what melts the hearts of stone, change the leper spots? I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood who fixed his loving eyes on me as near his cross I stood. And never till my dying breath will I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. But with a second look, he said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for your ransom paid. I died that you might live. Thus, while his death, my sin displays for all the world to view. Such is the mystery of grace. It seals my pardon too. With pleasing grief and mournful joy, my spirit now is filled that I should such a life destroy. Yet live by him I killed. Forever etched upon my mind is the look of him who died. That lamb I crucified. And now my life will sing the praise of pure atoning grace that looked on me and gladly took my place. Both believer and unbeliever alike need to see a fresh glimpse of God's love. Because the sight of God, listen, is what creates faith. You see, there's a couple different views on preaching. It's amazing how discussions 50 years ago really have not been changed. 50 years ago, I was reading this, one of my preaching heroes, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the question was, are sermons about information? Should you be communicating doctrine? Should you be filling up people's notebooks with Greek aorist tenses and Hebrew noun, well, Greek noun declensions and all that kind of stuff? There's another view that said, no, the people need relevance. You got to break it down. You got to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. You got to help them. You got a relevance and give them a to-do list at the end. That's what the people want. I'll paraphrase what Lloyd-Jones says. He said, he said, I would just say that both views, while there's truth in both of them, both of them are off. He said, the goal of a lecture is that you leave with information. The goal of a motivational speech is that you leave with action steps. But the goal of a sermon, the goal of a gospel sermon is that you leave worshiping. 
And the way that you worship is you see a sight of God. I realize that you are here for a time and you need to learn everything you can because knowledge is a gift of God and you're one of the finest places in the world to do it. But knowledge cannot give you the ability to give people sight. In fact, I would even say this, it goes as far as it is, there are some of you that I think your quest for knowledge wearies God. Because Jesus did not die to give you a head full of information. He gave you, he died to give you a heart full of passionate love for him. And one sight of the glory of God and the cross will do more for your heart than 10,000 Greek noun declensions. They certainly, the people that you're talking to, certainly don't need to hear some foolishness about their potential. They don't need to hear about them at all, except maybe at the very end as you're telling them how to apply it. They don't need to hear about what they need to go do for God. What they need to hear about is God. What they need to hear about is the beauty and the glory of God. Because it's not seeing your potential that's going to give you the empowerment to become what you become. It's going to see when you see that the one who had potential became nothing, that he could rescue you, and he took upon himself the form of a servant. They need to see God, which leaves us as leaders and teachers of God's word in a dilemma, does it not? Because no preacher can create spiritual sight. None of us. We can't, certainly can't do it through eloquent words. Even Paul couldn't do it. Which is why at the end of, 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 of one of the most brilliant explanations of the gospel, he puts his pen down and says, I pray that God, his spirit of revelation, would give you the ability to see what I am unable to get you to see. There's something only the spirit of God gives that is not able through knowledge, through, through, through oratory skill, through sitting through the best homiletics class on the planet. They can never give you the ability to help somebody see. Paul knew that from experience, didn't he? Because on the road to Damascus, there was nobody else in the world that had a head full of information as much as Paul did, but he was blind to the glory of Jesus Christ. So God knocked him off of his horse, gave him physical blindness as a picture of his spiritual blindness, and then took it away so that Paul, for the first time in his life, could see. So all Paul could do in Ephesians is essentially what Elisha did, present the glories of the gospel and then pray. God gives this kind of knowledge as a gift. It's not knowledge or just knowledge. It's not just skill and homiletics that can open eyes. It's being on your knees long in prayer and being broken continually by the gospel until you become so amazed by it that you begin to study it, not like a seminary and studies doctrine, but like a man who would study a, a sunset that would leave him speechless or or like a man engaged to a girl that he's enthralled with, would study her until he's so enthralled with her that he just loses all attraction for other women. That's how you've got to begin to study the gospel. Because that is what Ben begins to give sight. And nothing replaces sight. Nothing. And God's got to give it. And he gives it through the gospel. Why don't you bow your heads with me if you would. God, the tragedy is, and I know that I'm probably blind to my own blindness. And again, God, I cry out to you to take away a heart of stone and put in its place a heart of flesh that just looks at the beauties of the gospel and falls to its knees in worship and says, oh my God, how can it be that you, my God, have died for me? A heart that sees the weightiness of sin that crushes me and I say in the words of the hymn, that when I see and when I survey, I pour contempt on all my pride. A sight of the gospel that crushes me for those in the world and unreached people groups all around the planet that have never heard of the weightiness of this love that moves me to rush out attempting incredibly great things for you and expecting to flow from you because you're not willing that any should perish. God, open our eyes. Because I know that everything else that we do will flow from the sight of the crucified one. Look, you tell us, look. But God, we're blind and we can't see. So Holy Spirit, keep us away from not just the drunkenness with wine, but all the other distractions that deaden us to reality. Let our fears drive us to the love that's present in your heart. So that we rest in it, I pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.